So Paul Scott, welcome on the podcast. How's it going today? Etienne, thank you very much. Uh, if I'm brutally honest, I'm in the UK. It's absolutely boiling hot. I'm really, really not used to it. So um, I'm having a couple of beers. It's going to help me sleep this evening. So I make no bones about that. I make no apologies about that. So if you do see me swigging a beer, hey, you know, look, we've all got to relax. Love How that. Awesome. Awesome. And we were talking before some really interesting stuff. You are a supply and demand trader. I want to go back in yep. time a little bit. I want you to tell us like how to start to trade. What was that first moment? Okay, so the first moment um, was basically being born into a trading family. My father was a trader on the London Metal Exchange for around about 35 years. Um, as a young kid, I knew he bought and sold metal. I had absolutely no bloody idea what that was about at all. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you, I had no concept of what it was um, until he took me down there for the first day. Um I mean, as dads do, right? I'm 16 years old. I've just left school. And he says, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> no idea. I'm 16. You know, I've just left school. I've got no idea. So he said, okay, well, if you've got no idea and you can't come, with any, come up with anything concrete, you're coming to work with me and you're going to get some work experience and I'm going to get you a job. So, you know. Um, I went down to the London Metal Exchange as, as, as a fresh-faced kid at 16 years old. I wasn't getting paid um, and walked into a trading floor and had no idea what the hell it was. You know, I mean, I walked into a, you know, like a big trading floor with like four or 500 guys shouting, screaming, making funny hand signals at each other. And it was, in my mind, it was chaos. I mean, complete chaos. You've got, you know, it, all, it literally is this language. You know, they're talking in contangos and backwardations. They're talking spreads. They're talking Fed March, deck, you know, deck Jan and all this. And it's like, what the hell? I, I, this is so strange. Um, but it was one of those things that it's kind of like, I think the best way to ever get um, an introduction to the financial markets and really, you know, when you do it, is literally to be thrown in at the deep end. Because after around about six to eight weeks, he actually got me a job with a with a good friend of his, um, and he'd actually been there the day I was born. You know, that's how good of friends they were. Um, but I walked in there in, in that office to credit me in a rouse on a Monday morning, um, and I was pulled over to the side uh, by the guy that had employed me, and he basically told me in no uncertain terms, "You have three months." I don't give a shit whose son you are. You have three months. If you don't get it after three months, you're out. So it's like no pressure, you know. Um, but, you know, the good thing was, I was, you know, I had dad to fall back on because I could ask him, you know, sort of certain things and he could always help to explain it for me. Um, but, you know, the, the good thing is, and, and, the, and, and again, the difference between what happens at the institutions and in retail is, is you're taught by guys that have been doing this job for a heck of a long time before you, who were taught how to do this job for a heck of a long time before them. Um, and so it's constant on the job training. Um, and there are certain particular things that you pick up and you notice and you, you start to implement um, with your trading. Supply and demand. Um, is how the whole world works. I mean, it literally is how the whole world works. You know, we live in a supply and demand society. Um, we always have done it. Like it goes back to like day dot, right? Um, you know, like it's it, it, it's gas at the pump, it's houses, it's cars, it's jobs, it's, it's absolutely everything. But we're oblivious to it. The thing about it is, is it goes on in our everyday lives. And it certainly applies to financial markets because you have to look at who trades in financial markets. It's human beings. So we're naturally inclined to want to do things in a certain particular fashion. right? So supply and demand comes heavily into it, which is cheap and expensive, which is wholesale and retail. You know, if, if, if you figure the guy that's, you know, he's selling you know, clothing items in his store, right? He goes and buys them at wholesale. He sells them at retail. One's cheap, one's expensive. So, but the whole financial markets are made up of exactly the same methodology. So the guys back then were teaching you supply and demand, how to trade with those kind of levels. Were they watching charts or how did that work? 
Um, in the beginning, um, for me, it was very much about just price. Um, you start to look at charts a little bit later because then you see how price relates to what it actually looks like on a chart. Um, but we are all very price driven. We don't care about anything else. So, you know, in, in no time did I, in anybody that I worked with, you know, when I was a younger kid or as I got older, we don't look for chart patterns or trend lines or we don't use indicators. We do, multiple time frames, who cares? You know, time is nothing really in markets. It doesn't mean anything because what the institutions do is there are particular prices at which they revisit time and time and time and time again. And over the expanse of time, whether you go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, those prices that they revisit to do their own business doesn't change. Um, the only thing that changes about them is their valuation, basically upon what's happening today. Right. So let's just say for argument's sake that you get um, a piece of news in the market. Let's look at, you know, we're looking at the FX market here. Let's look at Mario Draghi, let's say from European Central Bank. Right. He's the, he's the president. Um, now, we've seen that guy move the market 400 pips in a day. Just purely on the basis of what he has said. So if you had a level you know, before he was speaking, that was essentially like kind of like right in the middle. Whatever he said has turned the price that the banks revisit to the upside. It's no longer expensive. Now it's cheap. OK, and so what markets do is they range between cheap and expensive, cheap and expensive, cheap and expensive until something fundamentally changes the valuation of one of those prices. Now, if you looked at it um, on a technical way, you wouldn't spot it. If you looked at it on purely fundamental, you wouldn't spot it. But if you understood that all markets are looked at and analyzed in a particular fashion by the real traders at the banks, it has nothing to do with anything that retail traders think that is important. And the thing about it is, if you can trace a market all the way back, and I'm talking decades, right? If you can do that and understand the language of the chart, because it does have its own language, okay? If you can understand that, that's the single most fundamental thing that you can ever learn. Because then you will also realize, you know, people put a heavy uh, valuation on news. But then look at news and look at the markets through the perspective of supply and demand, which is what I show people. And what you're actually going to notice is, is that the market really don't care about news. It really doesn't, you know, because if you think about it, you know, let's say let's go back to the 70s. So you've had wars, you've had rumors of wars, you've had financial crisis, you've had the dot-com bubble, you've had different presidents, different prime ministers, different interest rates, different rates of inflation. But what remains consistent and what remains the same, it's the same levels that the banks revisit time and time again. And the only thing about them that will change is the valuation of those particular levels. So if somebody says, well, last week this happened or two weeks ago this happened, well, I'm not particularly bothered about that because in the grand scheme of thing, if you're looking at something over a 20, 30, 40 year period, what the hell has last week got to do with it or the week before? You know, so it's, again, the, the, something that, I, you know, I'd really like to touch upon, um, which is the difference between institutional trading and retail trading, because you have to kind of look at the difference in, you know, between. If you're a trader at a bank, what's your primary function, Etienne? I think just before we talk about that, I want to go back on your story. So how was that learning curve? Like, did you learn properly after the three month mark or did you like what, what was your level of success after those three months? OK, so after those three months, well, basically, I'm still in the game, right? So I must have learned something. Yeah. Um, so I stayed at Credit Me and A for approximately around about two and a half years. And I then got, as is typical, 
well, it was typical sort of back then. You know, I had this um, one-to-one interview. Not kind of the same interviews that people have these days where it's very formal and it's in an office and you have an HR department person there. And No, this, this, this was in a pub after work, right? And the guy comes up to me and he says, right, I want you to work for me. I said, okay. He said, how much do you earn? I said, X amount. He said, okay, so we'll stick another 10000 on top of that. Um, and here's a signing on bonus. Okay, cool. I'm going to come and work for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So you're a young guy, right? Someone increases your salary by 10 grand. You're like, yeah, I'll do that. Thanks very much. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that was an interview in a pub. Uh, and so I moved from Credit DNA and to Sukdom Financial. I mean, again, when I got to Sukdom Financial, I was, you know, slightly older guy. And there, wow, um, traders that I work with there are absolutely amazing. Um, probably the most profitable um, team on the London Metal Exchange. I mean, these guys were absolutely brilliant. You know, I'm not going to name names. But they know who they are. I mean, absolutely bloody amazing traders. Um, and again, they taught you a heck of a lot, you know, um, about what the markets were. You know, I mean, you certainly never saw, you know, the head copper trader there sitting there pouring over charts, this, that and the other. No, he knew where he was trade from. He knew what was cheap. He knew what was expensive. You know, this is supply and demand. This is how the whole world works, how these, all of these markets work. Um, and we don't we, we never relied upon anything um anything else uh but from there you know so you go from basically being a clerk on the floor which is recording the trades that the traders are taking um between each other right as you go from there you progress you begin you start talking to clients on the phones again you know you've got to pass certain exams to be able to do that you know you can't just be any old tom dick or harry just pick the phone up you have to pass regulatory exams so you know did that and moved on to talking to clients, then moved on to, you know, sort of trading in metals there. Um, then we were, that was on a trading floor. I then moved upstairs. Um, and then I was working with a guy. He was another one that employed me. I said, right, I want you to come and work with me. I was like, right, okay. It's within the same company, but this guy was running something independently. He said, right, I want you to come and work for me. And I'm like, right, okay. And he's like, so how much do you earn? And I'm like, right, this much. And he says, well, I'll give you this much extra. Yes, please. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go and work for you now. So then we started trading not just in metals. So that was non-ferrous metals. Now we started trading in precious metals. Now we started trading in FX, um, which again just opened up this whole broad spectrum of markets that you're looking at. But we applied exactly the same methodology across every single market that we looked at and again that's what i really want to sort of suggest to people hey look currency trading is no different to metals trading is no different to oils trading is no different to gold is no different to stocks or shares or indices it's all the same but some people will come to the principle that markets behave differently like the fact that some strategies might work only on on a specific pair or only forex but not other things so how would you respond to that? Why would that be not the case? Well, because, I mean, again, I mean, if, you know, at institutional level, you understand that all markets are the same and, you know, you have to analyze them and look at them in the same fashion. I mean, let me give you an example of this. Now, this did happen twice to me when I was a young guy, right? Um, you walk into the office on Monday morning. And where the hell is everybody? Right. The whole trading team has been poached. Right. And they go to another bank. So what are you going to do if that happens? See, now, if you, uh, as, as, as an institution, said, right, you guys are trading non-ferrous metals, you're going to understand it this way, you're going to trade it this way, okay, right, you're trading oil, right, forget what the metals guys are doing, right, you're going to look at the market this way and you're going to trade it this way. And then you go to the precious metals desk and you say, right, forget what those two guys are doing, or those two desks, sorry, and you're going to look at the market this way and you're going to analyze it this way. And then you go to the soft commodities desk and so on and so forth. Right. Now, if you do that. It doesn't make common sense to do it. I mean, let alone business sense. Right. It doesn't even make common sense to do that, because if you do have a situation that arises where a whole group of traders have basically up and left. 
what are you going to do? I mean, are you going to pick the phone up to your client? Sorry, bud, can't trade today. I ain't got any traders. That's a good way to lose business, right? You can't just leave the phone to ring. And you can't just say, please leave a message after the beep, right? So what you have to do is, is you have to teach people, right, look, this is how we're going to look at markets. Gentlemen, ladies, sit down. This is what we're going to do. It's all going to be the same, right? But on your market, this is your terminology. If you're trading non-ferrous metals, you're trading in dollars per ton. That's you. Cool. Right. You're trading oil. You're trading in dollars and cents per barrel. Got that? Cool. You're trading gold. You're trading, right, in dollars and cents per troy ounce. Got that? Cool. Right. You're trading sugar. Right. You get what I mean? Right. Essentially, what you say is the fact that because traders of bank trade a certain way and they run the market, then other people should trade pretty much the same way on different markets. Yes. Understand it. Yeah, look. There's different terminology. Of course there is. There are different contracts and different contract sizes. But approach it in the same manner. Don't think that just because you're trading oil, it's a completely different market to FX. No, it isn't. Because, again, who are trading these markets? It's not robots. It's people. And before you say to me, Etienne, algorithms, right? Okay. Who programs those algorithms, but people, right? So they're going to stick. And what do people do? They stick to what they know. Okay. So they can program these things. Yeah, sure. They can do that and it will do it automatically for them. Um, I mean, me being old school, right? Um, I'd still like to make my own decisions. Thanks very much. You know, it's just one of those things. I'd still like to do that. Plus, the other thing is, um, if you looked at something, I mean, everybody's got an opinion on Donald Trump these days, right? Okay, so what opinion is a robot going to have on Donald Trump? Don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Is he going to take it as good news? Is he going to take it as bad news? I'd still like to make my own decisions. But I mean, if you looked um, from the perspective of just pure valuations on markets people will do the same things time and time again because why because we're human beings and it's a huge case of if it ain't broke don't fix it you know I mean, just keep doing the same things over and over and over and over again um i mean i mentioned this in a previous interview i did with a couple of guys in the uk but this is the thing you're so predictable you don't even know it Right. I'm so predictable. I know it because my missus tells me all the time. Right. You know, you're so bloody predictable. It's like reading a book. But again, if you apply, if you apply that to markets, a whole group of people um, that bought and sold here last time and did it the time before and the time before and the time before. Hey, guess what? When the price gets there again, are they just going to ignore it? Or are they just going to do the same stuff again and again? And again, um, and you know, just coming back to that retail versus institutional yeah, side, yeah, right. Retail versus institutional side. My thing in thing is, and the analogy that I use, and I think it's it's a pretty good one because I think most people can understand this, right? You have a magician on stage, yeah. Now the magician is dressed from head to toe in black. Why? Wants to be anonymous. Don't look at me. I ain't doing anything. Right. Now, they normally have an assistant, right, that wears bright, shiny clothes and prances up and down around the stage. Where are your eyes focused? They find on most people, but I would say the magician. You're going to say the magician? Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're one of them guys, right? You know, that's why you do the podcast, why you're trying to help people out. But where would most people? <laughs> yeah, the assistant, I suppose. Yeah, the assistant. Right. Okay, cool. Right. So we can establish that this is what most people are like. So they're not like this. So, so what are they doing? They're looking in the wrong place. Yeah, they're looking in the wrong place. The one that makes the magic happen is the magician. Now, I also look at the magician, as you do, but nine times out of ten. 
I can't even see what he's doing. I don't know about you, right? <laughs> what is your concentrate? Mm, no, I, I can't see what he's doing. But he's a magician. But it's ha- the, the, the point is, it's happening right in front of your eyes. But if you're distracted away, and let's look at this in the t- context of trading, what are you looking for, bud? You're looking for chart patterns, trend lines. You're using indicators. You're using multiple time frames. You're using Elliott Waves and Gang Fury and all of this crazy crap. Right? That's what you're doing. And the problem that lies with that is, is you don't care what price you trade at because you're going to go, you know, look, my MACD's crossed my RSI on a 15-minute and 30-minute chart. Hey, sell the euro. At what price? Right? At what price? What price are you trading at? Well, I don't give a shit. It just tells me that I need to sell it. Okay. So what valuation have the banks put on that price? I don't know. I don't care. Okay. you got to stop telling your trade. Do you understand why? No, not really. <laughs> Go and find another one. You know, that's there's a big problem with that. Um and, you know, that's one of the issues I've, I wanted to address. It's, it, it's this miseducation that really serves people very, very, very badly because, I, you know, just a straight question, right? You're a trader at a bank. What is your job? Making money. Right. Are the banks going to help you to do that? So when you mean they're going to help you, they're not going to do of the job course. for you, but they're going to tell they're going to put all the things in place to help you out take money, yeah. Exactly, right? So they're, they're basically going to say, you know, look, this is what you want to do. This is how you're going to do it. You know, look, you make money. You know, you make money. We make money. We pay you. Happy days, right? Now, if you flip that round and you look at the retail, okay, so the banks provide liquidity to a retail broker. Now, what's the retail broker's remit? He wants to make money. How does he make money? Transactions. One part. How else does he make money? When retail traders lose. How can I help retail traders lose? Right? We go to their website. And they have the educational section. Okay. Right. So they put their arm around you and they say, yeah, yeah, come on, buddy. I'm going to teach you how to trade. Right. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at that. And you go, wow, so many things to learn. It's going to be a long, hard job. Hey, look, I'm going to try all of this stuff. And guess what? It doesn't work. It doesn't work on purpose. Because they make money when you lose money. So are they really going to educate you into how to take their money from them? I mean, think about this, right? If you went into a bookmaker's, okay, and you said, right, I want 100 bucks on the number three horse at the Kentucky Derby to win. And the guy behind the counter says, don't put it on number three, put it on number seven. Well, that one's going to win. He's going to be your best pal, but he ain't going to be in business very long. Right? Mm-hmm. you got to stop and think about how do, how do these guys make money? They make money when I lose. It's in their interest that I lose. If they can help me along the way, <laughs> fantastic. If they can work with other people that portray this bullshit story, of chart patterns, trend lines, indicators, yada, 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 right? They're going to pay those guys to teach you how to lose. Mm-hmm. You've got to really stop and take a big, big, big step back and say, right, hold on a minute. These people make money when I lose money, so why the hell should I listen to them? Why should I go to the webinars and the seminars and download all of these videos? Why should I go to YouTube and start listening to some guy waffling on about Elliott waves and you know and, and, and Fibonacci levels and all of this stuff. Why should I do that? Find out. I, you know, just find out. What do the banks do? 
these guys control the market for 90% of the time, 90% of the day. Come and find out what they do. You know, it's it, it's not it's not something that's really freely available, but if you go out there and you really, really look and you cut through the reams of bullshit that's out there, and let's be honest, if you type FX, you know, FX trading course into Google, you know, other search engines are available, of course. But, you know, if you type that in, you're just going to get page after page after page after page of exactly the same things. Yeah. Now, I'm sure your listeners out there can appreciate that. You know, everybody says the same stuff. So then why, when I get people come to me, I've been trading two years, I've been trading three years, four years, five years, you know, something like 10 or 15 years. Uh, I've applied all of these techniques and they don't work. Think about it. Mm-hmm. Can so, you? I was just going to say, can you yeah. really imagine? There's a trader sitting there, Goldman Sachs, right now, shouting out to his boss, "Hey, boss, <laughs> right? My MACD's cost my RSI <laughs> on my 30 minute and 15 minute chart. I'm going to go and sell 50 million. What the hell is his boss going to say? What the hell were you smoking on the way into work this morning? Right? I mean, right. if you read think that that's what goes on that's a very good point yeah i would agree with that yeah you're crazy right you know yeah. it doesn't happen you know the thing is as well even if you're in the office and you get up to a level at which you want to trade from and you go hey boss look you know we've reached a supply level on the euro i'm going to go sell 50 million he'd still look at you and go what are you telling me for get on your job Am I here to babysit you? Am I your nanny? Do it. Get on with it. Don't do it. Come and tell me when you closed it out and show me how much money you've made. See, again, that's you know, people have to start to think about this stuff. Yeah. What really happens? You know, I mean, can you imagine a guy at Goldman doing that or Barclays or HSBC or anywhere, really? That would be really Come. funny, though, but I don't think it happens too much, for sure. Yeah. I don't think you ever have, but. <laughs> yeah. but um, so, so i feel like brokers have a lot of information like you talked about they have some good yeah. parts but you have to find them through the whole thing and they try to make it really hard to learn i feel from from what i've, from what I've read to brokers at least and at yeah. the same time even with supply and demand people have all these ways of saying that and i think there's a lot of confusion in that like some people say it's this it's that it's the opposite so how would you recommend people to start with supply and demand what would that look like well, I mean, what you've got to do is you've, you've got to look at value. You have to really sit down and say, okay, so what is the value here? Um, I need to study a chart to find out how many times this level has been deemed to be cheap over the years. How many times has this level been deemed to be expensive over the years? That can show itself on chart. Yes, you do have to learn how to really read it. Um but when you start out trading supply and demand, the big, biggest thing and the best thing you can ever do is take everything you think you know about the market. I mean, it's going to be hard for some people because they've been doing it a long time. Pick it up, throw it away, put it in the bin and say, right, screw that. Naked chart. Naked chart. Now, just look at that naked chart. Look at areas on there. Look, that looked to be expensive a heck of a lot of times. That looked to be cheap a heck of a lot of times. I can see it. We're looking at big expanses of time here. And I mean, look, the best thing anybody can do, you know, something like, you know, so many people use MetaTrader, right? Go to the MetaTrader, yeah, go into one of the settings where it says, like, time, one minute delete, five minute delete, 15 minute delete, one hour delete. Get rid of it, you know. Just get rid of it. It's all about perspective. So start getting rid of all of that crap because it's not going to help you. And if you do study markets on such shorter time frames, it's kind of like um, you know, standing in front of a steamroller on the road is coming along so slowly, right? It's not even noticeable, but then all of a sudden it's right upon you and splat. You just don't see things and you don't understand why the markets are doing certain particular things. Um, so 
I mean, even time is one of those things that's really hard to get across to people that time is irrelevant. So when you look at your chart, don't look upon it as oh, one month, one week, one day. No, just look at it as, I don't know, what's the best way to describe it? <sighs> a timeline. I know that sounds kind of stupid because I'm saying don't look at it as time, but just look at it as a timeline and understand that what you are looking at is human behavior. You're not looking at anything else. You're looking at human behavior and valuations that have been placed upon uh, particular price levels. See, now what I say to everybody is, is because every single market is all supply and demand, it is all cheap and expensive. Once you understand it's not what you're looking at, okay, dollar yen, euro, gold, platinum, palladium, orange juice, T bonds, Microsoft stock, you know, Dow Jones, it doesn't matter. Once you understand it's not what you're looking at, but it's more what you're looking for, then that is a very big liberating feeling for people and something that should really um, hit, really hit home. It doesn't matter what you look at. It's how you understand what that chart is actually saying. So, you know, if um, the, let's just say like a bank puts out a report, right? And some retail trader trades off of it and the trade goes wrong. You know, the banks are going to say what? We both had access to the same information. It's just how you interpret that information, right? Why you have teams of traders and then you have analysts, right? Which one tells who what to do? Definitely the analyst to the trader. Nope. <laughs> it's the trader to the analyst because the analyst comes to the trader and he says, right, what are you doing? Where are you buying? Where are you selling? I'm buying here. I'm selling here. Piss off. Leave me alone. I've got a job to do. I ain't got hours to sit here going through charts and, 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 and you know, making up all this bullshit story. I haven't got time to do that. I've got a day job. Thanks. I've got to facilitate my clients. OK, that's what I've got to do. You know, I've got to do that. Go away, make up your own bullshit story. I don't care. I literally don't care what you put out, but just say, I'm buying here and I'm selling here. And again, that comes down to um, value for money. Okay. And I, I, again, you know, look, if people have listening to the previous interview that I did, I'm just going to say exactly the same thing, right? You, Etienne, you are a company. You are, last year you paid me $10 million in commission to trade. Right? Are you, as a really valued client of my bank, going to be so happy that the analysis that you receive from my bank is a two line email that says buy here and sell here? No. Like, who the hell do these guys think they are? I paid them 10 million bucks in commission last year. They send me out a shitty two line email? Really? No, you want to feel you're getting value for money. So what's the bank going to do? Well, let's take here and here and let's funnel that over to the analysts, right? Well, what are the analysts going to do? Well, they're going to go, OK, so he's looking here and he's looking here. OK, we've got this two line email. We've got to turn this into a four page report. How are we going to do that? Right. What we'll do is let's put a Fibonacci level on doesn't really fit very well. I will well, scrap that. Okay, let's put a Bollinger Band on. <sighs> doesn't fit very well. I'll scrap it. Right, let's Elliott Wave look. If we just fudge it ever so slightly, right, we got one, two, three. Wicked. Right, we'll use that. Um, what else can we find? Trend line in there. Yeah, if we make it a bit wider. It's not, you know, thinning out, but make it a bit wide. You know, look at one, two, three, right, brilliant. Okay, let's get that. And now what we're going to do, now let's just go and find some, like, recent news, and we'll just go and write that up and, like, basically, you know, don't write it word for word because that would become stupid, but, you know, 
just put your own slant on it. And then what we'll do is we'll send that out to the clients and the client looks at it and he goes, wow, these guys are working so hard. I don't mind paying them 10 million bucks in commission. Look at this shit. It's amazing. Where's the value, bud? I'm buying here and I'm selling here. And that's it. All the rest of it is just window dressing bollocks. That's all it is. Right? Um, I, re I remember back at Credit Me and A, right? Love the guy, he was an absolute diamond. But he was brought in, right, in like 1995. I'd never heard of an analyst, right? And the guys that's sitting on the, the on the desk with an analyst's coming in? The fuck's an analyst? Who's an analyst? Well, he's going to sit down and he's going to trawl through all of these reports from all of these mining companies and, you know, how much, you know, how much copper that they're going to be producing. And it's going to be going forward two, three, four, five years. And this is his price predictions and all that. We used to sit down with Max. Right. Love him. I won't say his last name. But with Max, he just used to sit there and say, <laughs> what bullshit stuff are you going to write today then? <laughs> you know? Because we'd sit there and he would write these big bloody reports. I mean, like, but that's just a whole heap of shit. That's in the future. How do you know that you're not going to get, like, uh, an actual disaster in Chile? How do you know that Cadelco ain't going to close down some mines? How do you know what future price movement is going to happen? He'd sit there and happily go, I don't know, but I'm just paid to do this stuff. And you're like... All right, dude, you know, fair enough. You know, you're open and honest. He said, I've got no idea. Come on, let's be honest. I can't tell you where the price of copper is going to be in three years. But if you send that perspective or you send that out to the client, what's the client going to think? Oh, my God, these guys are amazing. It's very insightful. I think we'll have to wrap it up for here. But we might do a part two in the future or something. As I think there's a lot to cover more on that. But how can yes. people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out after the podcast? Um, well, I mean, I do run a trading course. Um, I'm not one of those that goes out there and does mass media campaigns. I don't do mail shots and all of this malarkey. Um, I very well, I think most people would describe me as working under the radar, right? Um, I am on LinkedIn. Um, I'm a person on LinkedIn. I mean, not all of my students come from LinkedIn, but, you know, some of them do. Um, but I actively ask for honest reviews. Um, and the reason I do that is because, again, as a website owner, you have access to all the content that goes onto your website, right? You, you own a website, right? You know exactly. Okay. Um, so <laughs> some of these testimonials that you fight you know, it's like, hey, like, it's Dave from Montreal or, it's, you know, it's John from Toronto. It's a testimonial, right? You can write whatever the hell you want. It's your website, right? You can do that. See, now, the difference between me and, you know, the, the average Joe, I go, no, can, can you do me a favor? Like, on your LinkedIn page, could you leave me a recommendation? So that you could link in with me on LinkedIn and actually go and visit that guy's page and actually read what he wrote on his page. And then you could come back to mine and you could read exactly the same thing. Right. Because it's not BS. Yeah. It's not bullshit. Um, so I actively ask for people like that. Now, you know, look, I have a lot, of, as you know, people that teach how to trade and they all claim um, to do certain things, this, that and the other. And go and check out, just for yourself, I mean, just a nice little thing to do. How many people actually actively ask for reviews on LinkedIn? I mean, I've checked them out. I mean, go and do it for yourself. I check them. Nobody. Why? Because they all perpetuate the same bullshit story of chart patterns, trend lines, indicators, multiple time frames, Fibonacci levels. It's all rubbish. Um, so LinkedIn, it is Paul Scott FX. Uh, I do run a website. Don't expect anything flash at all. It's no point. Uh, as I've often said to people, the world's full of bullshit. There's no point in adding to it, right? Uh, so that is paulscottfx.com. Um, there you could listen to a previous interview I did with a couple of guys in the, uh, in the UK. Really looking forward, obviously, with your permission to 
put this up on the website. It'd be really great to reach out to more people in North America. Um, and that's about it. You know, I mean, I'm not one of those guys. I mean, look, I mean, let's be honest with the people that, you know, we're doing this interview with. You know, Etienne very kindly tried to set me up on Google with doing this thing and we can do this interview. And I'm a complete moron. I've got no idea how to use this stuff. And in the end, he was like, yeah, let's make it simple. Let's just use Skype, right? Which was kind of nice because I know how to use Skype. but don't know how to use anything else. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I am who I am. I work with people that approach me. I don't go out there actively to do it. I maybe work with three, four, five, six people a month and that's it. Um, you know, I teach people on a one-to-one -one basis. I think that's the best thing to ever do. I don't think teaching in classrooms is sort of anything um, really any good because, I mean, again, um, I think it very much comes down to peer pressure. You know, if you're sitting there in a classroom and you're kind of stumped on what the guy's saying and you don't really want to put your hand up, as you kind of feel like, well, if I put my hand up, I am going to look stupid, but I'm holding up the rest of the group. But then obviously that leads into C, which is, is he's now talking for another 10 minutes. I didn't understand what he said 10 minutes ago. So am I really understanding what the guy's saying now? You know, so, you know I'm, I'm a great believer in doing things on a one to one basis. Um, but I mean, look, if you're interested, I have articles on LinkedIn. Uh, again, which is Paul Scott FX, you go on there. Uh, on, on LinkedIn um, regarding you know sort of the differences between retail trading and institutional trading and some of the pitfalls that you can try and avoid um, I often try to call out bullshit merchants um, on LinkedIn uh, I often ask them just innocent questions uh, most of the time I end up getting blocked um, which kind of makes me laugh because you know you've you know you've hit the nail right on the head um, and then of course you know it's um, just things like this you know this is like the second interview i've ever done um in my life <laughs> still feels kind of weird um but yeah you know it's it's it, it, it'd be nice to just help people to understand that yes you can make money from trading yes you really can make money from trading but come on look <laughs> if you really think you know what we said right there's someone sitting at Goldman shouting this stuff out. I mean, come on. That's not how the markets work. It never has been. Yeah. So we'll make sure to put all the links you talk about in the show notes on the website as well, so people can check them out. There's all going to be linked there, everything you talked about for today. And I want to ask you maybe one last question. If you could give people one, one sentence of advice, something you can apply, let's say, this week or next month, what would that sentence of advice be? Okay. Um, honestly... Honestly, okay. So every course that you've bought, every book that you've bought, every DVD that you've ever bought, every CD that you've ever bought, do yourself a favor. Take that out into the garden, light up the barbecue, and burn it. Right? Forget it. Go back. Hey, look, it might have cost you a lot of money. It might have cost you a lot of time. Um, it might have cost you a lot of emotional stress and time. But strip everything back and just remember a retail broker makes money when you lose. Everything that you think you know about the markets isn't true. So don't, you know, you've been trying lots of these methodologies um, for quite some time and you've come to the realization that they don't work. So I think it was Einstein, wasn't it, that said, you know, the definition of insanity is, you know, like banging your head against the wall and expecting a different outcome. You know, you've been using this stuff for a heck of a long time. It doesn't work. Right. So stop. Take a step back. Maybe take two weeks off, three weeks off, four weeks off. Just sit down, calm down, chill out and say, OK, right. I'm going to do this in a totally different fashion. I need to understand how the banks work. Let me do some research. I need to understand how the banks trade. I need to do some research. History, as they say, will always tell us what's going to happen in the future because what's the same? History always repeats itself. 
All right, Paul, we'll have to wrap it up, but thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure, and we'll catch you guys pretty soon.